In Mark's gospel, Jesus said to his disciples, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For he that will save his life shall lose it. He that loses his life for my sake shall find it. For what did it profit a man if he gained the whole world and suffered the loss of his own soul? Or what exchange shall a man give for his soul? For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will render to every man according to his works. Indeed, could there be a work more challenging or more important than truly being a living witness to Catholicism for God first and then for your own children? St. Augustine wrote a work called The City of God. He juxtaposed two types of people. In the city of man, there are men who love themselves with a contempt for God. In the city of God, there are men who love God with contempt of self. Which one are you? You were empowered to do this in your confirmation. You were anointed just like Jesus was in his baptism out of the Jordan through the sacrament to do this for your family. It's possible. Jesus set out in his disciples from this village of Caesarea Philippi, and along the way he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? He said in reply, John the Baptist, others Elijah, still others one of the prophets. He asked them, who do you say that I am? Peter said in reply, you are the Messiah the anointed one. Then he warned them not to tell anyone about him. He began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer greatly and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and the scribes and be killed and rise after three days. He spoke this openly. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. At this he turned around, looking at his disciples, and rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. You're thinking not as God does, but as human beings do. See, the world tells you to run away from suffering, just like Peter was telling Christ to run away from it. And he says, no, that's, that's thinking like a man in your fallen nature. Think like God. You need to run toward the cross. That's what transforms you, not running away from it. And it's not compassionate to remove someone's suffering. It's compassionate to suffer with them. The etymology of that word, the meaning of it originally is to suffer with, not remove suffering from someone. The world has this upside down. I'm saying this to you because... What vice is keeping us from living a life of virtue and pursuing holiness? The best argument for and against Catholicism are Catholics. And any other human institution that's had this many bumbling knuckleheads running it for 2,000 years would have already fallen apart. That's a divine accomplishment, not a human one. And I work for the church, and I'm saying that. You got a beef with the church? Get in line. So does everybody else. It's not a reason to leave. The magisterium can be an inspiration like Fulton Sheen has been for me. Or it can be a scandal like Ted McCarrick has been for me. We too as parents can be an inspiration to our children as Catholics or a scandal to them. I'm going to leave a book here tonight that I've read that really impacted me and I think you guys might enjoy. It's called Parenting for Eternity. I have a copy I'll put at the back table if you're interested in picking it up. Maybe they'll give away it as a door prize, or maybe you can check it out. But I would take the time to read it. I'm going to share an excerpt from that book that really hit me, and I'm an engaged parent. Dear parent, you walk a fine line, seemingly between teaching your child humility and developing a strong self-esteem. The world has never, nor ever will, esteem humility. Just look around. Everything is geared toward vanity, self-promotion, and self-indulgence. Truly, your child is growing up in an unprecedented promotion of self-indulgence and a vanity. What is important to understand, however, is that true self-esteem comes from humility. Humility is, rather simply put, the proper knowledge of self in relation to God. He is God, I'm not. There is nothing more freeing for your child than to know that Almighty God is infinitely greater and more powerful, more knowledgeable than he or she will ever be. This doesn't destroy their confidence. No, it gives them a greater sense of security, purpose, and a placement in this vast universe. Humility is everything. Humility was so real, they nailed it to a cross. They couldn't handle the truth with a capital T, so they had to get rid of it. The world is very much the same today. A saint learns how to view all thoughts, words, and actions as either the act of pride or an act of humility. For truly, every thought, word, and action is taking us closer or further away from God. Every step toward God is a step away from something else. I said that earlier. I have a deep devotion to Our Lady. 
She's your spiritual mother too. She is the perfect disciple and the imitator of this perfect humility that we're striving for. As a creature, we want to be as conformed and unified to Christ through grace the way she was. That's why we say she's our hope in the Salve Regina. Ask her and St. Joseph to parent you in the faith and then cooperate with God's grace that he's going to give you to do that with your own child. An excerpt about Mary from Pope St. John Paul II in Catechesia Tridende. She was the first disciple above all else because no one has been taught by God to such depth. She was both mother and disciple. As St. Augustine said of her, venturing to add that her discipleship was more important to her than her motherhood. There are good grounds for the statements made in the Synod Hall that Mary is a living catechism and the mother and model of catechist. Christian formators, you, on this feast day of her assumption, may she be our God in our universal home, the church, in our individual homes, our domestic church. If you have had a child in here, think about that statement. Her discipleship was more important than her motherhood. That's a profound statement. I've gone all over the country sharing a story about my middle son. Tonight I want to finish with one about my eldest son. He is the story behind the story, and I rarely get a chance to share anything about him with other people. I was praying to Roji one morning when he, on a, he went on a, um, a, a trip to Cove Crest one summer with Life Team with uh, Mr. Kyle Melanson, who was the youth minister at Holy Cross, where he was confirmed in his confirmation coordinator. He's now just got appointed to be the youth and young adult minister for the Diocese of Lafayette. He's gonna work with me in my office. He starts next month. I was sitting in my chair praying a rosary and on my phone I got a text message with a picture of my son at camp. And I rarely post things on Facebook because I think social media is just so toxic. You can break the Eighth Commandment so easily on social media. You can slander someone's reputation, calumnate them. These are grave sins. And in James chapter 3, in the book of James, it says we should bridle our tongue, and we often don't do that. Get to know somebody. See their story from the way they view it, not the way you view it, from the outside looking in, but the inside looking out. Allow them to do that for you. And your relationship with them and other people is going to change quite a bit. This is the picture I got. This is what the post says. People post many things about their children on social media. I don't do that because I always believe it's more powerful when someone else affirms your child rather than you. It eliminates partiality and rose-colored biases. Today, I'm breaking that trend because at 7 to 1 a.m. this morning, one of my brothers in Christ sent me this picture while I was in the middle of a daily rosary with the following message. That's your son. He's three times the man I was at 16 years old. And his selfless love for his brothers, especially his brother in a wheelchair, is the most inspiring thing for me as his dad. People don't often get what drives individuals because they only see a situation from the outside looking in. This captured moment gives someone on the outside looking in a view from the inside out. I pray for Ephraim and all those kids at this event this week that they embrace the cross of Jesus Christ or have life thrusted upon them. One of my favorite passages of sacred scripture is Galatians chapter 6, verse 14, where St. Paul says, I boast of nothing but the cross of Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. I'm a dad. I can only speak from a dad's perspective. And I embrace fatherhood completely. And I make no apologies for that to anyone. So I'll close where I began. Are we conforming this counterfeit Christ that we like to create to our image and likeness? Or are we allowing the authentic, objective truth itself, who took on a human nature, entered into time and space, redeemed the world, established a church for the salvation of souls? Are we conforming ourselves to him? Because the answer to that question determines the kind of Catholics you and I are today. And sociological studies definitively show it also determines the kind of Catholic our child is going to be tomorrow. I have to answer that question for myself, and I'll have to answer for it in my particular judgment. 
If you've done everything you can do as a parent, and your child still walks away, they have free will, that's not on you. That's on them. But if you've been neglectful in that, and they didn't get the faith handed on to them because you were neglecting doing that, that is on you. Repent. Start over. Start today. Make it better. And with God's grace in your life, all things are possible. And you just might allow your child to get you to heaven. And in the process, you might get them there too. God love you. Thank you.